Hello and welcome back fellow path integrators. Today we're going to solve the Basel problem. But before we're going to solve the Basel problem, we have to dive a little bit into its history. And it all starts in the 1600s with the Italian mathematician Pietro Mengoli, who was very much into the research of infinite series. He was the mathematician who found out that the alternating harmonic series has the value the natural log of two. And in 1650, he proposed the famously known Basel problem. He wondered, what is the value that we get if we sum up the squared inverse natural numbers up into infinity? Which means like, what value do we get if we sum up 1 plus 1 fourth plus 1 ninth plus 1 sixteenth and so on up into infinity? Well, it took over 80 years until this problem has been solved and it has been solved by no one else than the famously known Leonhard Euler. And Leonhard Euler was a 27 year old mathematician living in Basel, a town in Switzerland, which is why the problem nowadays is known as the Basel problem in honor of the one who first solved it. And Leonhard Euler found out that the infinite series of the squared inverse natural numbers has the value pi squared over 6. A truly wonderful result. Since then, multiple proofs for the Basel problem have been found and today we're going to look at a very special one, at the one proposed by the mathematician Tom Apostol. Tom Apostol's proof starts with this integral. We have dealt with this integral in a previous video showing that the integral is equal to the sum of the inverse squared natural numbers, which is also like the zeta function at the value 2. Why is that the case? Well, it all starts with taking a look at the integrand and seeing that it resembles the solution of a geometric series. So we write the geometric series of the integrand and then we drag out the sum out of the integral and we integrate with respect to y, then we integrate with respect to x. Of course, we evaluate at the limits 1 and 0 and then we get the sum starting at n being 0 going up to infinity of 1 divided by n plus 1 in brackets squared. And now we do a simple shift of the sum index so we don't start at n being 0, we start at n equals 1 and then we get the famously known formula for the zeta function of 2. So we know the relationship between the zeta function of 2, thus the inverse squared sum of the natural numbers, but in order to actually prove that this is equal to pi squared over 6, we have to calculate this integral here. And in order to calculate this integral, we have to perform a change of coordinates. We're going to change our coordinate system from xy coordinates to uv coordinates. And the transformation equations look like this. So we have x being equal to u minus v and we have y being equal to u plus v. If we add x and y together, we also get transformation equations for u and v respectively. So u being equal to x plus y divided by 2 and v being equal to y minus x divided by 2. So how does the integration area now change? Let's take a look at how the integration area actually looks in xy coordinates. There we just have a simple square, like it goes from 0 to 1 on the x-axis, it goes from 0 to 1 on the y-axis. Let's just call this integration area b. How does the integration area change with our change of coordinates? Well, let's plug in all the points of the square that we have and what we will get is a flipped square, which we will call s. So this is how our integration area looks like in the new coordinate system of uv coordinates. This means that our integral area now changes from b to integrating over s. All right, so what are we doing now? Well, as it is with changing coordinates, we need to perform the Jacobian determinant. But in our case, it's rather simple. Luckily, it equals 2. So this means that the integral over the integration area b is equal to 2 times the integral over the integration area s and with plugged in u and v from the transformation equations that we had.
So we have to calculate this integral now. In order to do so, we have to take a look again at the integration area in the UV coordinates. So first we have that triangle on the left side and the area on that left side will be expressed by the integral from 0 to 1 half and from 0 to u over the integrand 1 divided by v squared plus in brackets 1 minus u squared dv du. Then we have the triangle on the right side and this will be expressed through the integral from 1 half to 1 and from 0 to 1 minus u and the integrand doesn't change, it's the same as in the integral above. Since the integration area is symmetrical, we have the same triangles also on the lower side of the flipped square, which means that both of those integrals above need to be multiplied by 2. So now we can go on to solve our integral, actually, which will be 2 from the Jacobian determinant times 2 from the symmetry of the integration area S times the sum of the two integrals that we just found in the slide before. So what we have to do now is we have to calculate those two integrals. First, we're going to calculate them with respect to the integration variable V. And if we do that, we will get the following integral. So we have four times in brackets the sum of the two integrals, one integral going from 0 to 1 half over the integrand arctan of u divided by square root of 1 minus u squared times du divided by the square root of 1 minus u squared. And then the other integral that is being added to that goes from the limits 1 half to 1 over the integrand arctan of 1 minus u divided by the square root of 1 minus u squared times du over 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared. So the first integral we will call it i1 and the second integral we will call it i2. So what we have to do now is we have to calculate that formula four times the sum of the two integrals. So in order to solve this integral, we want to get rid of the arctan because the arctan is pretty annoying when we're dealing with the integral. So what we want is that this, that we get something like arctan of tangents of some angle theta. So this means that what we have inside the arctan, the argument u divided by the square root of 1 minus u squared, this must equal the tangents of theta. And the tangents of theta is nothing else than the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta. So we get two equations here. We get u being equal to sine of theta and we get the square root of 1 minus u squared being equal to cosine of theta. Well, this is kind of obvious. We just get that u is equal to sine of theta and then we can perform a change of variables by calculating du being cosine of theta times d theta. Let's plug that in into the integral. So we have the integral from 0 to 1 half over the arctan of u divided by the square root of 1 minus u squared times du divided by the square, square root of 1 minus u squared. And this is equal to the integral with the changed limits, arc sine of 0 up on the lower part and on the upper part arc sine of 1 half. And then we plug in what we got, arctan of tangents of theta. And the arctan of the tangents of theta is just theta. So what we get is the integral from 0 to pi over 6 over the integrand theta, d theta. And this is just a polynomial which we can easily solve. And then we get that the result for this integral is pi squared over 62. And this is the searched result for the integral i1. So now that we have the integral i1, we need to solve the second integral. To solve the second integral, we're going to do it similarly. Um, first, we're going to rewrite what is written as the argument of the arctan a little bit using binomial formulas, and we will get that 1 minus u divided by the square root of 1 minus u squared is equal to the square root of 1 minus u divided by 1 plus u. So this should now equal the tangents of theta, which is 
the quotient of sine of theta and cosine of theta. This means that we get two equations. The first equation is the square root of 1 minus u being equal to sine of theta. This means that 1 minus u is equal to the sine squared of theta. And this means that u is equal to 1 minus sine squared of theta. The second equation that we get is the square root of 1 plus u being equal to cosine of theta. This means that 1 plus u is equal to cosine squared of theta, and this again means that u is equal to cosine squared of theta minus 1. So now together with the addition theorem that cosine of 2 theta is equal to 1 minus sine squared of theta, we will get that u has to equal cosine of 2 theta. And now we can do another change of variables again, with u being cosine of 2 theta, we will get that du is equal to minus 2 times the sine of theta d theta. Now let's plug that in into the integral. So we have the integral from 1 half to 1 over the big integrand with the arc tan, and this changes to minus 2 times the integral with the limits arc cos of 1 half and arc cos of 1 on the top, and then again we have the integrand arctan of tangens of theta and this is just theta, a polynomial, and what we will get is that this integral is equal to pi squared over 36. And this is the required solution that we needed for the integral i2. Now we can add everything up together to get the final solution for the Basel problem. So what we have to do is we have to take 4 times the sum of the two integrals and this is 4 times pi squared over 72 plus pi squared over 36 and if we do the math then what we get is pi squared over 6. So I hope that you liked this solution, that you liked this proof. I liked it very much because it makes use of beautiful integrals and um, yeah, if you like this video, leave a like, <laughs> thanks. Um, subscribe to my channel, that would be cool, that would be great support. And um, yeah, let me know in the comments how you found it. That would be nice. I always like chatting with you guys about maths. It's incredible, I love it. So yeah, um, that's it. Thanks for staying so long with me. You're great and see you in the next video. Bye!